Well, thank you. That's like asking which of my children I like the most. Um, uh, you know, we have a we have a philosophy in the company that we don't really bring a project in unless we love it. Um, you know, there's so many things to work on, and we're relatively unique that we have a development and regulatory and and um, you know uh, testing engine at Tonix that we pick from a huge array of different projects to take on. About half of our programs are brought in from the outside and about half of them have come from, you know, purely internal work. Um, but, you know, I like them all. They're at different stages of development and, um, you know, they, they all are directed toward, you know, unmet needs and things where we believe we have an edge. So I think in each of the areas, we think that we're gonna be best in class. But um, I'm, uh, I'm, I love them all. Yeah, thank you, Rob. There's a big need for more specific medicines to promote tolerance in organ transplantation. So the holy grail in organ transplantation is tolerance, meaning that the organ will be accepted, but the host will also be able to mount normal immune responses against other, against other pathogens. And I, I was an immunologist for 20 years at Columbia Medical School as a tenured professor at the Department of Medicine and ran a basic research lab. So I've been working on this for many years. Now, I said the holy grail, it's very unlikely that any one or two drugs short-term are going to yield tolerance, but that's the goal. So I've been working to that end to, for more than 25 years. Now, we believe that tolerance can be achieved because of pregnancy. Pregnancy is an unbelievable example of the you know, body's engineering where a pregnant mother tolerates the fetus, which is should by all rights be strongly rejected because half of the uh, MHC molecules, the transplantation antigens on the fetus are from the father. So what's normally a strongly immunogenic thing that should be rejected is not only tolerated, but a pregnant woman can make effective responses to pathogens and recover from colds and pneumonia and COVID and a lot of other things. So we all believe it can happen and we are all trying to find medicines that can make it happen. I've been fortunate to be working in the area of CD40 ligand for 25 years. And we believe this is close. I believe the closest that people have gotten to a drug that can um, induce tolerance. So uh, we're, we're working on it now. We have a, we have a third generation anti-CD40 ligand antibody, and we're working principally with um, Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, and we have some really encouraging uh, data, some of which has been presented in our investor deck and other data um, we, we expect to um, uh, present over time, but in, including at the um, American uh, Transplantation Congress uh, coming up in June. Thank you. You know, the, the cycle times for these drugs, the, the product development cycle for a drug and, and is long and for a therapeutic target is even longer. So in this case, it's really taken three generations of targeted therapeutics to get to what I think is the, you know, the group that really has figured out, um, you know, how, how to get results. And um, I, I was, as, as you mentioned, I was at Columbia University as an assistant professor. I, you know, my lab, we discovered the CD40 ligand, made an antibody, partnered with Biogen. It was really the dawn of the monoclonal antibody era. So this was really out there with one of the first humanized antibodies in development. 
and we got really great results in terms of efficacy, but the development was halted because of an increased risk of thrombosis. Thrombosis means blood clotting. It was not uh, foreseen from the animal data and other things, it was somewhat unexpected. And it also, um, it didn't happen that often. So it was pretty hard to figure out the basis of the side effect. That led to the second generation monoclonal antibodies, which by and large um, either eliminated a portion of the antibody called the FC or crystallizable fragment, um, and another group um, uh, mutated it, and another group um, uh, made it so that um, it couldn't have a sugar molecule on it. And so there was a lot of hints that if you, you know, eliminated or weakened this FC portion of the antibody, you could, you know, drastically reduce, if not remove, the risk of increased thrombosis. And now we're in the third generation where we've added back some of the FC functionality, um, but you know, we believe have continued to uh, have a drastically reduced uh, risk of thrombosis. Yeah, thanks. The original ones were IgG1, and that, that's it called the, the uh, IgG is the isotype, and then, um, you know, uh, one, two, three, four is the subtype. So um, IgG1s um, were, you know, the, the original antibodies, and they were the ones that were associated with the increased risk of thrombosis. So um, we, and actually other people, have uh, systematically uh, made changes in the um, FC region and, um, uh, you know, yielded antibodies that, that, that have reduced risk. Uh, and um, the, we are moving forward with a modified IgG4 monoclonal antibody, but that's not the only path to reduce the risk. The risk really seems to be associated when the FC region of, of these antibodies binds to a receptor called FC gamma R2A. So that once we had a good screening tool to uh, make modifications that we could measure against binding for FC gamma R2A, you know, the, uh, it, it became, uh, well, to some extent clear, another extent took a lot of art and experimentation to find one that would have the right qualities. But we see it as a progression that the first group of indications we're targeting is around solid organ transplantation. And that would be um, kidney transplant, heart transplant. Those are the first areas we're working in, but you know, this clearly extends to liver transplant and other things. And there really is a very big need for more specific immunosuppression. Now there's always been a, more, a, a big need for it. The existing medicines have side effects, and it, it's really a trade-off. But one of the things that's really decimated the transplant community has been COVID. And COVID teaches that we need to very specifically try to induce tolerance as opposed to uh, immunosuppression. Because if you immunosuppress people, it looks like they're going to have a very tough time with COVID. And as I'm sure you know, we're, we're, both of our companies are based in New Jersey. Um, there is COVID everywhere now, and there doesn't seem to be any respite from it. Um, you know, we 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 just got over Omicron, then we were hit with BA two, and now you know BA four and BA five are in South Africa, headed our way. So it doesn't even look like this is going to be seasonal. It looks like this is going to be overlapping, almost continuous waves of new variants of COVID until we get a better handle on it. 
And this has been really devastating for the transplant community. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're right at a point where before COVID, we'd really gotten to great survivability, uh, organ preservation of, of both, you know, graph, graph rejection free, um, uh, graft acceptance, but also graft function. And now COVID's thrown a real uh, wrench in all this. So there's an urgency in developing better transplant medicines like never before in the 25 years that I've been working in this area. So I think it's timely that we're out there, we're, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of very interesting data in organ transplant that, you know, some is in our investor presentation, but more will be forthcoming soon. Uh, so that, you know, we think that this could be uh, a very interesting time and a needed, a needed addition to the armamentarium. Yeah, we're, we're delighted. We're, we're working with two um, uh, professors there. There's um, Professor um, Richard Pearson, who's a heart transplant surgeon, and Professor Tatsuo Kawai, who's a kidney transplant surgeon. Now they do other organs. I mean, Pearson does hearts and lungs, heart lung combined, everything. And then um, Kawai does a number of other, you know, things, you know, mostly abdominal uh, transplants but they're mostly known for heart and kidney. And that's where our uh, collaboration has started. Now, these are also two leaders in surgery, uh, in transplant surgery, both um, for a number of reasons, but the immunology of it, inducing long-term tolerance, graft acceptance, and some of the uh, tools that they've developed that are in use today. So um, uh, they're mostly working in non-human primates right now. Um, which are their established model and, and um, you know, comparing uh, what, you know, the effects of our new antibody with some of the historical um, effects of, of other agents and also head-to-head uh, -head comparisons. And some of that information is in our investor presentation already. Well, we've guided that we expect to be in phase one trials before the end of this year. And um, we think because of the characteristics of our product specifically, but also because of the characteristics of monoclonal antibodies, that um, it, there can be a very short wait between phase one and phase two. Monoclonal antibodies are very specific for uh, their target, generally speaking. So if, if as expected, you know, we get the profile um, that, that we're projecting from the monkey work, we got the same thing in human, we could be in human transplant studies very quickly after that. So um, things are moving very quickly. And, and I say, you know, one of the things is a transplant is the, um, you know, first indication we're working on. But after that, we think that there's a lot of applications in areas like auto, treating autoimmune disease. 